Wise.com, the one and only podcast with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform geeks. My name is Nightwise, and for the coming 60 minutes or so, I'll be your host on this episode of the Nightwise.com podcast. Welcome to the live recording of KW808. If you're not uh, familiar with the concept, you can become so. This is the live recording of a weekly podcast that I record, the Nightwise.com podcast. We are a website that is geared towards hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform geeks, and we are recording weekly podcasts with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform sliders, people who jump from OS to OS, and we find ways to let technology work for them instead of the other way around. What you're going to get is a raw version of the podcast. This is an audio podcast that will be aired tomorrow and that people who have subscribed to the nightwise.com media feed will automatically get in their podcatcher. We are uh, doing the rough bit. You're going to see the behind the scenes. You're going to see me blunder and blooper. You're even gonna have me, uh, gonna see me have coffee out of a take that mug, which is about the worst mug that I can use. And you're also invited to my studio here at Nightwise.com HQ, where uh, my geeky entourage and uh, gadgetry is of course uh, well displayed. So I hope you enjoy. If you don't want to listen to the entire recording of uh, the podcast, you can just download the finished product on our website www.nightwise.com and there you'll be able to do so. So let's get started. I am uh, going to record this podcast on uh, two different platforms. I'm going to record this one on Google Plus, of course, which is going to be aired on Google Plus, uh, on Google Plus on YouTube and uh, available as a video stream. And I'm also going to record it in um, Audacity. Let me just show you Audacity right here. That is my recording software of choice where I am already testing my levels to see if everything is loud enough. Doesn't seem to be. You see that this has to go all the way up to zero. So just gonna crank down the volume on my microphone, slightly up it on here and see that we don't overmodulate on Google Plus, but this is exactly how I want it and where I want it. So uh, those are the levels that we like. Quickly gonna listen back to that. On here and see that we don't overmodulate on Google Plus, but this is exactly how I want it and where I There you go. It becomes routine after a while uh, doing these kinds of recordings, but I do also always want to share with you guys about what we actually do and how it actually works and uh, what happens behind the scene. It's not that complicated, actually, to record a podcast. It isn't. But um, once you get the hang of it, that is. And that is what we've had. So um, let me just stir my coffee, get my show notes. Where are my show notes? Here they are. I don't completely do this from memory. This, of course, uh, does mean that I do need my show notes. And here are my show notes. So this is what I basically use to keep track of uh, what I'm talking about and at least keep some structure inside everything that's going on. So that's that. Meanwhile, you don't hear it on the background. I, I mention it every week when I record. The MacBook Pro that I'm using is fuming. This is a this is an i5 16 gig SSD MacBook Pro, which is really struggling, well, not struggling, but performing optimally in getting this done. So um, I'm going to try record this next week when um, when I have the time on Ubuntu because I have dual booted that Mac and I can. Uh, put it up into Ubuntu, because I read this great article that says that when you install Linux on a Mac, it massively outperforms OS X on the same machine, which is really funny to see, but hey, here you have it. Okay, let's get started. Uh, Let's see here. The Mac's not going to be any more quiet, but I have noticed it's really hot. I should start thinking about upgrading, I guess. Um... 
as I was saying, uh, we're going to get started with the intro, and and then you'll learn what the show is about, and you can follow along, and um, that's that. If you're on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, uh, you can just hit uh, nightwise.com slash subscribe into your favorite uh, podcatcher, and that subscribes you to our feed where you get all the episodes automatically, so don't worry. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. More coffee. And I have gotten some feedback from a lot of listeners uh, of the YouTube channel about uh, my office and all the geeky things that I have here. And I sometimes try to to put something new there, so just to keep you guys entertained. But you know, I'm a kind of a nerd. You probably know that. But here we go. <laughs> Enough chitter chatter. All right. All right, here we go. So the podcast is actually recorded in a couple of parts, and those are edited down and mashed together at the end so as to make a finished product. And they, you they get jingles and a nice sound bed. This is the really rough, rough. And we don't do bloopers, because if you watch this video, you get the bloopers. <laughs> okay, here we go. On the edge of real and cyberspace, there's one place you can go, and you found it. Welcome to Nightwise.com, the one and only podcast with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform geeks. Whether you're a Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS, Android, or Sun Solaris user, we have the stuff you need to tune tech into your way of life and let the technology work for you. My name is Nightwise, and for the coming 60 minutes or so, I'll be your host on this episode of the Nightwise.com podcast, KW808 holiday anonymity. For more information and the show notes, head on over to the website www.nightwise.com, that's K-N-I-G-H-T-W-I-S-E.com, where you will find the links to everything we talk about and the nightwise.com media feed. Subscribe to that feed and get all of the nightwise.com podcasts delivered to your favorite podcatcher automatically, letting technology work for you. Hey guys and girls, it's once again great to be behind the microphone. No show last week because I was on a little bit of a holiday in the north of France. We packed up our tent and the dogs and we went out for a little R&R in the north of France, right next to La Cap Griné, if you want to look that up on... Um, on Google Maps or something. Great place to go, nice walks, very relaxing, and no internet connectivity whatsoever. Very challenging, but also very, very relaxing. And while I was there, I did have the need to connect to the internet from time to time, and that brought upon the inspiration for this show, together with the book that I was reading. I'm currently reading, um, and I completely forgot the author, so I'll put it in the show notes. I am reading The Snowden Files about the um, revelations done by Edward Snowden about the, um, well, the sniffing and the wiretapping that the NSA and the British GCHQ is doing on all our internet traffic. And when I say all, I do mean all. Phone calls, internet, nothing seemed to be safe, and anonymity was something that was far, far gone. I've also read 1984 by George Orwell, and I must say that sometimes fact and fiction come closer together than I am comfortable with. And it got me thinking about me, uh, about how I stand against anonymity and how I stand against security. A couple of weeks ago, we did a... um, a special on the blog called Security Week, where I did a column and I um, said in that column that I do worry about the NSA and the uh, GCHQ sniffing my traffic, but I worry more about uh, the teenager next door or the teenager, the, the, the skinky teenager in the corner of the coffee shop with his laptop. I worry more about that guy. I worry more about the people who are a little bit further down the line and have very interesting projects they can do to intercept your traffic when you are, for example, on holiday. When you are using that public Wi-Fi hotspot, who else is on there? Who is sniffing? Who is looking? Who is doing what with your information? 
I have a problem with government agencies sniffing my traffic when I've done nothing wrong, but I have even a bigger problem with citizens, fellow citizens doing the same thing. I don't like to be sniffed when I am on a public Wi-Fi or when I am on a public computer. With this being the holiday season, the vacation season, as the Americans would say, or holiday, and the Brits would say vacation, I always forget, the summer holidays, where we all go abroad and drop our very well-trusted and connected 3G point-to-point -point connections and have to rely on public Wi-Fi in the hotels, we will need to start wondering about our security and our anonymity and, of course, about the integrity of the data that we use. More and more things that we're using are becoming digital, our communications, our purchases, our interactions. And the question is, who do you want sniffing along? Possibly no one. And there are extreme measures that you can take to make sure that you are encrypted and anonymized all the way up to the mega sniffers of the NSA. But what about a little bit further downstream? What about dugging the 16-year-old script kitty in the coffee shop who is... Uh, well, happily sniffing up your Wi-Fi traffic and your conversations and is looking at the URLs you are visiting. And what about the people with the pineapples who try to uh, try to uh, make you believe that they are your trusted hotspot while they actually intercept the traffic? What about them? How are you going to keep yourself safe. And what about those public computers in hotels and in libraries? I mean, you enter your information, but can it be seen by whoever comes after you? What traces do you want to leave? A lot of questions, and we're going to answer them in this episode of the Nightwise.com podcast. KW808, Holiday Anonymity. Okay, that went well. All right, now I save this, I'll show you. Meanwhile, I think that my Mac is trying to take off. It is really, literally trying to take off. I know I absolutely bitch and... Mm, mm, no, bitch was the bad word, sorry. <laughs> Be and mm, bitch and moan about this every single week, but still, um, I think it's really annoying, and I'm always afraid that you'll hear it in the recording. So far not, I'll just give a quick listen here. In this episode... And I can, with audacity, actually cut that, uh, completely eliminate that. I know that some of my audio philistic podcast listeners are going like, noise reduction, noise reduction. Yes, I know. I know. And I will. <laughs> Just uh, let me save this one first. File. Export. So I export them. KW808. P1. Uh, I export them as WAV files not as mp3 files, to the desktop first, and they become the basic beginnings of uh, of the show. There you go, that's part one, ready for part two. Back to, back to, back to the main monitor, there you go. So, that's how I do it. All right, let's do part two. Why bother? Nightwise, why in hell's bells would I bother? I have nothing to hide. I'm not doing anything wrong. There's no problem with me not being completely anonymous. Everybody can see what I'm surfing to. Yeah, sure, sure. If you believe that, sure. If you believe that, if you really, really believe that you have nothing to hide, then why are you still wearing pants? It's something that is very, very, well, illogical. It's, it's logical. Why are you still wearing pants? Ask yourself the question. Do you actually hurt uh, somebody or yourself when you're not wearing pants? Hell, it's even more comfortable. I might not be wearing pants right now. You can't tell. And that's it. You can't tell. Because if you were to go outside and not wear pants, you wouldn't basically be doing anything wrong, except from shocking people. But you have nothing to hide. There's nothing inside your pants that you're that's wrong. There's nothing secret. Everybody kind of knows what's going to be there. And um, so why bother? Why bother hiding them? And since we're at it, forget pants, forget doors on bathroom stalls. How many people a year are getting caught inside 
past bathroom stalls because the lock of the door is closed or is, is broken when they're on the inside. So let's just forget the locks. Oh, let's do let's go one step beyond. Forget the doors. There's nothing that you do there that is unnatural. You're doing your business, so you're not doing anything wrong. You don't have anything to really hide, but yet still you close and lock the door. So you kind of want yourself to have some privacy. Why is that? Tell me. You're not doing anything wrong, so why? Well, it's the same thing with the internet. Privacy and anonymity is not something that uh, you ha that you cannot have. That it is a basic right. Privacy and anonymity are not for those who have something to hide. No, privacy and anonymity are for everybody. The great way of trying to break privacy and anonymity is, of course, by saying everybody who's keeping something secret and everybody who tries to anonymize himself is doing something wrong. And that is a basic flaw in the way people think. By the way, if you, on the background, hear bells ringing, I'm really sorry, it's the church nearby and they're going nuts. But that's something that the government loves or, or whatever agencies in power love to let you believe when you have something to hide you're doing something wrong and that is not true it's the other way around by principle and by nature you are entitled to privacy and anonymity and only when you are doing something wrong there is, is there a certain reason why that privacy and that anonymity should be taken away that's it. You have a right to have curtains behind your windows. You have a right to close the bathroom stall door when you're doing the business. It's not something that is granted to you. No, it's something that you have. And I did talk about the fact that, yeah, we're talking about government agencies or people spoofing, but anybody who spoofs or who sniffs or who looks at your um, information can be, you know, kind of uh, categorized in the same category. There are people trying to look at your data. And whether they work at the NSA or are some dingy script kid at the corner of the coffee shop, neither of them have the right to know what you're doing. Not because you're doing something wrong, but basically because it's your right. Now, why am I saying this? And really, excuse me, I'm going to close the window. I've never done this on a live recording, actually going out and closing the window. I might just cut it, uh, edit it out, but I just closed the window for the sound in the background because it was also distracting me. And when I'm on a rant, I don't want to be distracted. So we talked about the right of privacy and anonymity that you have, and then we gonna, we're going to talk about the dangers. Yeah, sure. There are ways to protect yourself, and there are ways to protect yourself in different zones. There are ways to protect yourself in your physical environment. There are ways to protect yourself in your immediate environment. And there are ways to protect yourself all over the internet and really become completely anonymous. And the best way is to go sit in a forest, cut your internet connection, go dig a hole and sit in it. Presumably with an aluminum foil or aluminum, 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 uh, tin foil hat. With a tin foil hat. Doesn't be aluminum or aluminum or aluminum. Aluminum is, by the way, a night is nightwiseism because it doesn't exist and it bridges the Brits and the Americans. Aluminum, 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 what, whatever. So you know, the best way to be completely safe and anonymous is to sit in a hole in the forest with a tinfoil hat and no internet. Good, fine. But what we're going to focus on today is not how to beat the spooks from the NSA or the GCHQ or whatever secret service is trying to snoop up your metadata. No, we're going to talk about the people in your immediate environment. The people that have the possibility to immediately get access to the data that you inter-exchange with the internet. Possibly the ones that are, you know, with you, around you, on your holiday. Because I went to... Um, Thailand uh, a couple of months ago and it was really funny to see that you know there were people or kids who lived lived in the lobby because that was the place where they could get free internet and they were there 24 7 24 7 every time I came in outside it was beautiful weather and this is one of the most beautiful countries on the world in the world no boom these kids were there on the internet constantly and it was kind of sad 
And I wondered why they were in the lobby, but then I kind of figured out that this was the only place where they could get free Wi-Fi. Now, what does that mean? It was a free open Wi-Fi network. Why were they in danger? Well, I'll tell you, and this goes back to how Ethernet or IP or networks work. In the very, 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 very old days, you used to have a hub. A hub was a little machine that you would put on the, on the counter and you would plug your computer into the hub and you would plug several computers into the hub and the hub would be connected to the router and the router would connect to the internet. And whenever a little package came along, and it went to one of the computers that was connected, like for example, you know, an image of a web page or a bit there or a byte there. It went all over, all through the hub, and it would actually talk to all the computers on the network and say, "Hey, I am, uh, I'm a greasy picture number twenty-five, and I want to go to uh, Barney's computer. Yeah, yeah. Are you Barney's computer? No, I'm not. Are you Barney's computer? No, I'm not. Are you Barney's computer? Yes, I am. Hey, here's the greasy picture. Hey, hello, hello. That's how the internet works. You know, that's how uh, inter uh, network traffic over a hub worked. The traffic that would come in would be viewable by every computer connected to the hub. Now, with a switch, it's a different thing. Most devices these days are switches. That means that there is kind of a private connection between you and the switch. So you look up greasy picture 15. It comes back. Hey, I'm a greasy picture 15. I was supposed to go to Barney's computer. Oh, yeah, that's that port. And all the other computers don't actually see the traffic. So this is what we call a shared medium and a non-shared medium. So a shared medium is a network connection where every computer on that network sees the packages, the information flow through. It doesn't act on it because it's not for its IP address, but it sees it. So, hey, here's a pretty picture number 13 going to Davy's computer. Hey, Davy, hey, Davy, here's the picture. But what if you have a little application? So, now these days, switches and stuff, okay, it's kind of secure. I mean, if you plug into a switch and it goes to the router, it's between you and the router, you know? From there, it's fair game, but whatever. But what about wireless? Well, in wireless, it's just like with a hub, really. That means that everybody connected to the wireless networks, to the, to the wireless network, sees the same traffic. So that means if you are sending an unencrypted MSN message out to the internet and it comes back, everybody basically sees it. The other computers don't respond to it, but hey, they can see it. Every bit of data that goes over the network is passed via your network card. It goes in front of your network card. Now, because of the nature of the internet, your computer will only respond to the packages that are, you know, intended for it. You know, I have a greasy picture for Barney, and your name, your computer's name is Barney, or just its IP address is Barney. Okay, just you know, make it simple. It only goes to Barney, and and Davy and and Huey and Dewey and Louie on the network go like me. Not for me, not for me, not interested. So what if you would have an application that would say, oh, I'll well, we'll take a look at that. What if you connect an application to a wireless network that says, oh, okay, I'll have a look at that. So here's a greasy picture for Barney. Okay, I'll have a look at that. Here's a greasy picture for Davey. I'll have a look at that. Here's the text message for Andy. I'll have a look at that. And that application basically takes a look at every package that comes along and saves it on the hard drive so that the person afterwards can really go through every bits and bytes and take a look at what traffic is there. That is how a wireless hotspot works, and anything that is not encrypted can be seen as clear as day. And this means that uh, internet addresses and wherever you surf, everybody, everybody can see that on the wireless network if they have the right software. And the great news is the wireless software is free, it's cross-platform, and it's ridiculously easy to operate. There used to be a fantastic um, hack back in the days um, that was a Firefox extension that would literally look at a wireless network, see whoever was logging into Facebook, intercept the login and the password, and log into Facebook on your computer with their credentials. 
I can tell you, I tried it. It's hilarious doing an update on their status while they're at the other side of the coffee shop, not knowing what's going on, but suddenly seeing that they have just posted that, oh my God, my incontinence is back. That's how simple it is. You know, any script kitty can do that. But then you say like, yeah, Nightwise, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not a douche, I'm not a dork. Uh, I know this. I protect myself. I use encryption. What you can use, we'll talk about that later. I'll tell you danger number two. You go into the hotel lobby and you fire up your laptop and there are two hotspots. One of them is hotel lobby Wi-Fi free. And the other one is free Wi-Fi hotel lobby. Now, which one is it? Well, both are open. I can connect to both of them and it just works. What's wrong? Well, one of the two is actually a 16-year-old script kitty with two network cards on his laptop. One of his wireless network cards is connected to the hotel Wi-Fi, and the other one is telling you it's Wi-Fi free hotel, where the SSID of the hotel is hotel free Wi-Fi. So you accidentally connect to the wrong one, and you say like, well, <laughs> everything works. Yeah, but everything is passing through the laptop of that person. This is called honeypotting, and I can tell you, if you have ever tried it, I'll put a link in the show notes because it's a real simple program that you can install on, on any Ubuntu system or any Linux system. You just need two wireless network cards or 3G card. All you need to do is plug in one wireless network card and give that the, uh, the SSID or the network ID of the honeypot. One. The second network card you connect to the internet, and then you wait. You really go fish. Because I've, th I've done this, I've connected my laptop to a 3G modem to have an internet connection, and I plugged in an extra net wireless network card, and I called it free Wi-Fi. And all I did was sit in a cafe here in town and wait. And sure as hell, bing, 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 people would connect through me and through my internet connection, and I would be able to intercept all of their traffic. When it's free, when it's Wi-Fi, and it's unencrypted, and it's open, people will connect. So then you say like, okay, Nightwise, that's dangerous. What else is out there? Well, I'll, I'll one-up you. You know what? I will set up on an open wireless network that I have spoofed myself, for example, a, well, a DNS spoof. And you're going to ask me, what's a DNS spoof? Well, very simple. When you type in www.facebook.com, you go to the DNS server of your ISP and it directs you to an IP address and that goes that points you towards a web server that gives you the login page for Facebook. No problem, right? Well, yes. Let's say I put a D D H DNS server on that network. You connect to my wireless router or wireless hotspot by my fishy, fishy wireless no hotspot. And when you type in www.facebook.com, you are given an IP address by my DNS server and you go to a fake Facebook page that I've set up and you enter in your credentials. And there you have it. You just gave me your password because on a lower level, I've intercepted your traffic and pointed it to a completely different destination than it should have gone to. So that's DNF, DNS spoofing. And if you really want to be scared, I talked about the pineapple in the intro, and we did a special on the pineapple. I put a link in the show notes. This is this really scary device that has a Wi-Fi antenna on one end and the 3G router on the other. And you have it in your pocket, and you walk around, and there's a piece of software on that that says yes to everything. Now, how does Wi-Fi work? Very simple. Your iPhone, your laptop, your smartphone, whatever, that is ever connected to a Wi-Fi hotspot remembers this. It remembers every network name that you've ever connected to. And it actually calls these names out all the time. You know, if you ever connect to free Wi-Fi, it will keep shouting, free Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, when you have your wireless on, free Wi-Fi. And then it connects with the pineapple. And the pineapple has a piece of software that says, whenever somebody calls a network name, just say yes. And the pineapple goes, it's me. Jawohl. Yeah. Oh, says your laptop slash smartphone. Oh, free Wi-Fi. There you are again where you met before. Haha, <laughs> here, I'll connect to you. And whoopah, you go on the internet through the pineapple. 
So you're making an internet connection through a third party. And that, of course, that third party is, of course, dumping all of your information on an SD card so it can uh, analyze it later or has a DNS server running that points you to the different Facebook page where it can intercept either your login credentials. And if you're really lucky, it will point you to a fake banking site. And the great thing is your phone doesn't know because you still have your Wi-Fi on. You're just, just merrily, merrily shouting around, you know, free Wi-Fi. And um, when it connects to Wi-Fi, it will drop its own data connection and go like, oh, I have Wi-Fi. I don't need 3G anymore, so I'm just going to go through there. And a pineapple is $99, and you can stick it in your pocket, and everybody can own it. You know, it's that simple. So all of those things are dangerous. And then there's the fact that, you know, when you're out, out and about in the strange, big, bad world that's not your home Wi-Fi network, you might even run into the fact that you need to use a third-party computer. And, oh, God, I, ugh, I hate using public computers. I've once read an article that toilet seats are less infected with bacteria than keyboards, and this is the truth. Um, we've actually had at my former place of work somebody come along and scan and scrub our keyboards and give them a bacteriological uh, score. Just, you know, it's a dirty scale. How dirty is this? And man, man, these were really, really dirty. So aside from the fact that, ick, um, it's also a fact that you're using an operating system that you're you're not familiar with. You don't know what malware is on there. You don't know what keyloggers on are on there, and you don't know who is going to log in and check the history when you when you're gone. So even on guest computers, you know, public computers in hotel lobbies or libraries, there is an added risk. Yeah, sure, you circumvent the whole night, the whole Wi-Fi thing by just hitting one of the computers that are there, but who ever knows whatever happened to that computer, and who knows what's running on the background. So, to protect you against all this before you leave on your summer holidays and leave your trusted Wi-Fi networks or 3G connections behind, we have some tips and some tweaks for you. And those are the ones that we're going to share with you. So let's get into the meat of the matter. Well, that's going well. There we go. That's part, part two. Well, export... KW808P2. I was, um, I did a, a skit on, uh, on an episode on HBR this week about the fact that you don't always need new gear. There goes the fire department. That you don't always need new gear. And um, it's true, you don't always need new gear. Let me just check my messages here. Sorry for being asocial, but um, you hear that? That's a that's a fire department again. That's a cool thing where I live. Whenever the fire department has to leave town east, they have to pass by my house, and they uh, it really makes a lot a lot of noise. Always nice when you're recording a podcast. Okay, that's two. All right. Now, what I was saying, um, I did this episode on HPR where I talked about the fact that you don't always need to buy new gear and you can really get along just fine with older computers these days if you don't do the really awesome stuff that you want to buy new gear for. So, for example, if you have a really want a new laptop and you say, yeah, I need that because I want to run VMs, you've got to ask yourself the question, how many times, for how long, and is it really worth it? And one of the things I was wondering about is, do I need a new computer for video editing and stuff? How many times am I going to do that? But since I'm recording on YouTube on a weekly basis, and I, f I, I really feel this sucker getting hot, it might not be so, it might not be so bad to get to get me an i7 with everything. <laughs> Took a look at the MacBook Pro, 13-inch Retina. I7, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 500 gigabyte SSD is a monster. But on the other hand, it does get its daily use here. And it might, I might type on it four to five days a week uh, and do mediocre stuff. But when I do stuff like this, I do notice that you know the CPU really needs to step up. So it might be a purchase that I can 
actually justify. <clears throat> it's not going to be. You know what? It's it's gonna, it's going to hurt. But on the other hand, my Macs always have helped me. You know, I'm I'm not a Mac lover, but I do love their hardware. And even if you want to run Linux, running it on a Mac is awesome. It just works. I've got a Lenovo right here. I love the machine. I absolutely love it to death. It's my favorite Linux machine, but. Man, did I have to jump through hoops to get Linux really working on it. And when I do it on my Mac, which is not supposed to run Linux, it just works. Whatever. Okay, <laughs> let's get into the next part. I'm doing two podcasts in one. Three, two, one. So, how do you protect yourself? How do you keep the greasy picture for Larry going only to Larry and not to Bob and John and, and you know and Huey and Dewey and Louie. How do you do that? How do you keep your traffic yours when you're out and about when you are abroad, when you are in the Wi-Fi of the hotel or at school or in the library or even at work? The first thing that I advise is use when you're browsing the internet protect your browser, protect your browser traffic. Most of the things we do these days are on the internet, so protecting your traffic is very, very important. That means that whatever website, you have to think for yourself, you're connected to a, to a Wi-Fi network that's not yours, okay? You open up your browser, okay? And every URL that you type in is going to be visible by everybody else who has the right software. So just think about that, you know? Like, xhamster.com is something that you really want to type in, whatever you want to, but everybody sees it. So that's going to be one. So if you go surfing, just make sure that the content that you access is encrypted, that people who are watching on the network don't see actually bit by bit what you're really uh, pulling in. I want to give an example by using POP3. POP3 is a mail protocol that downloads your email messages from a server. POP3 is unencrypted. That means that if you open up your mail client, it will connect to the mail server, send out your login and your password, and pull down your mails. This is, by default, all done in clear text. That means that everybody on the network can see that. And there are really simple filters you can download to sniff traffic, get the logins, the passwords, and the emails, right out of the traffic stream and look at them. It's really simple. So encrypting your traffic, making sure that, yeah, sure, the bits will go around the network, but nobody will be able to make, to make sense of it is very important. And this is called encryption. So when it comes to your browser, yeah, okay, people are going to see when you type in www.gmail.com, but the rest of the, of the communication has to be encrypted. And that is done by using HTTPS or HTTP secure. This means that the traffic between you and the website is encrypted and the average script kitty won't be able to break that encryption just in, in, in just a couple of seconds. So use HTTPS wherever you can. If you're using Chrome or Firefox, there is a great extension that is called HTTPS Everywhere. And what this extension will do is whenever you enter a URL, it will ask the web server that you want to visit. Hey, by the way, you got a, um, hey man, you got uh, security for me, man. You got some, uh, you know, HTTPS for me, huh, man? Can you do it, uh, you know, can we do it securely? And when that web server says, you're, you're sure we can, okay, then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll do it securely. So even if, there goes the fire department again. So even if you have um, a standard website that has both an HTTP and an HTTPS protocol or URL, the extension will make it default to the HTTPS. So always use HTTPS on a public network when you're giving in, giving away logins and passwords and, and typing in emails and doing anything in a web page, make sure it's HTTPS. So that's important. We can go one step further. We can actually anonymize your entire traffic. That means that the traffic that you're using will leave your computer, you know, the websites that you're visiting, whatever they are, will leave your computer on an encrypted network and will not leave towards the internet on the hotel router, but will 
continue to tunnel through the internet and leave at some random point on the globe. So that means that the encrypted tunnel that you just did from you to your website is completely opaque from you all the way to some far end of the world and then to your website. And the great piece of software you can do uh, you can use for that is called the Tor browser. Tor is the onion router and it's basically a uh, I don't know if it's an open source, uh, but it is a free piece of software that you can download and that will help you be anonymous. So I'll explain how it works. Let's say you're here and you want to go and watch the BBC iPlayer website. I type in the URL of the BBC iPlayer. It will leave my network at my router. It will go to my ISP and it will leave my ISP and connect to the HT to the web server of the BBC. Where the BBC will say, I'm sorry, old chap, you're not part of the Great British Commonwealth. You're not paying your radio and TV tax, so you cannot watch iPlayer. Why? Because the BBC iPlayer website takes a good look at my traffic and says, you're from Belgium. We don't like people from Belgium. They don't pay licenses and TV taxes, so you can't watch iPlayer. Okay, okay. So what if I could, you know kind of leave to the internet somewhere else. Not on my ISP, but in some random port. And that's where the Onion Router comes in. You can tunnel into the Onion Router with something like a Tor client or Tor browser, and it will randomize your exit point onto the net all over the world. There are, on, there are Tor ports run by everybody and your traffic gets mixed and mashed up and some part of it leaves in, 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 in Brazil and some part of it leaves in Germany and some in Sweden and for people who are trying to see where the hell is this guy coming from, they don't know. And that's what the Tor browser is good for, but the Tor browser is good for something else. It will hide where you're surfing to not only to the people who are on the Wi-Fi network, but also to the IT folks of the uh, router of the hotel. They don't see where you're going. They just see some tunnel going out to the internet and, and exiting somewhere far beyond their reach. And there, the request for the website xhamster.com goes onto the internet. So not only have you, uh, you've actually encapsulated your traffic into some kind of opaque piece of pipe that leaves the network. And in that piece of pipe, you also have to use HTTP to keep your traffic safe in that pipe. Because you always have to try to, um, how am I going to tell this, to offset your privacy against the channels that you're using. So right now, the public hotel Wi-Fi, we're using two layers of security. A, we're using the Tor network, so we're basically going out through an opaque tube to the internet somewhere. And for the people of the Tor network, you say, well, I like using your service, but I'm still going to encrypt your traffic. So even you don't see what I'm doing. So see, security, insecurity, insecurity. The Tor browser is a portable app, and I would highly, highly advise to use that when you're out and about. Just use that browser, and you, you will know that you know your traffic is anonymized, your, it's, in, it's encapsulated in an opaque tunnel and nobody sees which URLs you are punching into the browser. I love using my Tor browser when I do searches that are, for example, for, I don't know, a torn file that is also sold in a shop. I'm not really sure what I mean by that, but you know what I mean. But also, if you are, for example, on your school network or on your work, uh, at work, or you are, you know, somewhere where your browsing habits might be used against you, the Tor network is a great way to jump the fence and leave for the internet, not through the gate that has been uh, given to you by your uh, employer, school, whatever, but on a point on the internet that is completely random and that anonymizes your traffic. If you run Linux, there is the Tor bundle, which is great because then you can Torify any application because there are, of course, more applications on your laptop than just your browser. There might be a chat client on there or an email client. And that's a great thing about using Tor on Linux. You don't only have the Tor browser, but you can also Torify any application that you want. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I use this 
is when I want to test the outside of my own network. When I want to attack my own network from the outside, I can't do that from the inside. When I leave for my router, my router says, I know you, you're coming from in here. But when I use the Tor network, I suddenly leave the internet in Uzbekistan and I come back towards my home network and it says, you're a stranger. And that's great for testing purposes. So that that's fire truck number five. Wow, it's really exciting today. Now, what I was saying is, um, lost my trail of thought. The great thing about uh, the Tor bundle on Linux is that you can Torify any application. That means that you can using the right command, in the command line, I think you have to enter Torify space and the name of the application. You can just say, you know, Torify Thunderbird. And it will traffic all the traffic of Thunderbird through the Tor network and not the rest. Just, just you know, Thunderbird. So that's a great way to use the Tor network for different applications other than the Tor browser. I have to put a disclaimer here. You don't know where you're going to exit on the internet and you don't know who's gonna own the exit point. Everybody who owns an exit point can actually see the traffic going out. It will have a hard time tracing who it's from, but they can see. So always be aware you are, your privacy is always in direct relation to whoever is servicing your exit point on the internet. So, you know, that's why I said Tor is encapsulation make sure to use encryption inside that encapsulation. So that's protecting your browser and your browser traffic. But what about protecting everything? I mean, literally everything. I want every single bit on my computer that leaves for the internet to be secure. How do I do that? How do I set that up? We'll talk about that in the next part. Okay, that's part three. Man, between the fire department <laughs> and my laptop being so noisy, I hope that you can understand a word I'm saying. Export, that's going to be part three. KW808P123. Okay. All right, let's go for part four. So what if you want to secure your complete traffic? As I said, we talked about encryption and encapsulation. Encryption is jumbling up the data. Encapsulation is shoving the entire data stream through a bigger pipe that is also encrypted. So, you know, secrets inside secrets. So you can do that with your entire computer and there are a couple of solutions out there. A lot of the, the time when we talk about uh, these things, they talk, we talk about VPN, a VPN service. What is a VPN service? A VPN service is kind of like a VPN tunnel is um, a private network cable between you and wherever your VPN endpoint is. And nobody can see what traffic is in there. So it's not like an HTTPS where only the web traffic is encrypted, or like Tor where the entire website traffic is encrypted and you exit somewhere else. No, with a VPN, every bit of your computer is encrypted in a special private tunnel that goes to your VPN endpoint. Now, VPN used to be something that was used by companies, by people who were out and about and needed to connect back to the network of the company. So they would set up a VPN tunnel between their laptop and the inside of the company network. The, the traffic between the laptop and the inside of the company network was, of course, completely encrypted and encapsulated. But, yeah, that was nice to go back home. But now we are trying to use, we're starting to see the use of VPN to protect yourself in what I call the first mile, the first mile, the coffee shop, the first wireless network you're, you're on. So what you can do is you can buy VPN endpoint services. You can uh, chuck some money around and um, have a VPN client on your laptop. So whenever you want to connect, you're in the coffee shop or in the hotel or at school, you just activate the VPN tunnel and all of your traffic goes through the VPN tunnel, completely opaque, 
and will leave for the internet at the point of the VPN provider. Nice, nice to, you know, to uh, protect your traffic, but sometimes these services cost money and you don't always know who these providers are and what they are doing with your data, especially if they're offering the services for free. You gotta be a little bit careful because they might analyze the traffic that is coming out at, the, at their end to see if they can target some ads to you. So it's nice, it's simple, it's convenient, and it will protect you in the first mile. It will protect you um, at, at, at the, the school network, it will protect you on the hotel network, and if you want a quick and simple and dirty solution, please do so, get one. When you're on a holiday and stuff with your laptop and you, do, you want your data to be safe when it leaves the internet, do that. When you're a little bit more of a geek, you can, of course, set up your own VPN endpoint at home. And when you're using Linux or even the Mac or Windows, you can quite easily set up a VPN server. You need to have a static IP or dynamic IP with DNS redirection. We'll talk about that in, a, in another episode. And you need to have the right ports open. So anytime you start your VPN client on your computer, it will connect to your home network. It's actually quite cool because you're at home when you're not at home. It has two uh, dis distinct upsides, one of them being the fact that um, your traffic is anonymized and, well, not, is, is encrypted, and two is that you can connect to your home network. My God. So there are a lot of routers these days that support VPN. Uh, I have an Asus router here in uh, RT68U or an AC68U, um, which offers uh, a VPN endpoint for a PPTP connection, for an open VPN connection, for an L2TP connection. These are all different kinds of encryption. But you can also set one up on your uh, Mac server uh, or on your Linux machine or even on a Windows machine so that they're just an endpoint of, for your VPN hose to connect to. Another if you say, yeah, yeah Nightwise, that's great, um, but I don't want to really set up a VPN. Another way that you can do it is by using an SSH server. Now, you know, we talk about SSH server here all the time. I've been talking about SSH servers for, what, five years now? If you haven't set one up right now, just do it. Why? Because SSH is a very simple way to connect to you, your computer server slash you can enter terminal commands and do all kinds of crazy things but it's also usable as a uh, VPN endpoint or what we call a SOX5 proxy but that's technical mumbo jumbo we won't get into that what it is is a socket on your server that you can plug your VPN cable tube into so you're out and about and you say like oh I want all my traffic to be encrypted but I don't want to send up a, v a fancy VPN server at home, right? but I have an SSH server. Well, that's enough. You just need one port, port 22, or whatever port you designated to be SSH, and you can connect to that. What you need, let's cook. What you need, recipe, you need an SSH server. If you haven't got one by now, get one. You need that port to be open to the internet. You need a static IP or uh, a dynamic DNS uh, name to connect back to home on the server side. That's all you need, login, password, and an SSH server. Boom, one port is enough. Then you need on uh, your Mac or your uh, Linux machine an application called Shuttle, S-S-H-U-T-T-L-E. Uh, it's a command line command, very easy to install. It works on a Mac, it, it works on a Mac, it works on, Lin uh, on Linux, and all you need to do is type in that command that says shuttle space, and then which traffic you want to direct through the tunnel. And automatically, a tunnel is set up that directs everything, even your DNS requests, through that tunnel. So you're gonna really pull a pull a Cat5 internet cable through the internet from wherever you are. To your home router actually or to your SSH server and it's gonna forward your traffic through your own home router onto the internet so it's just like being at home it's really cool I mean I've watched I've, I've streamed music that way because you know you're not only not only do you have a, a, um, a protected internet connection but you also have a connection to your home network and it just takes one port and one very simple command I have written in detail how SSH shuttle works 
uh, and I'll put a link in the show notes so I won't go techno babble on you. Works on a Mac, works on Linux, works great. But I know what you're going to say, Nightwise. It's all te- it's all command line stuff. I don't like command line stuff. Go away. I don't like to type. Okay, that's good. And by the way, Nightwise, I have a Windows machine. Well, that's good for you too, especially if you have a Windows machine. You should be listening to this episode. There is a great application called ProxyCap. ProxyCap is um, kind of like Shuttle, but with a graphical front end. ProxyCap is a proxy client that will let you connect to a proxy. A proxy server is a server on the internet that will put you on the internet, and your connection between you and said server can be encrypted or not. So proxies were used in the old days to speed up internet traffic, but ProxyCap is a great proxy client. Why? Because it's connecting to your SSH server at home. It's so cool. You can just install it on your Mac and on your Windows machine, and you just say, like, okay, ProxyCap, here's my server, all right? This is my server. This is my server here right at home. And then you enter in the IP address or the dynamic DNS hostname of your home SSH server. And then you say what port you connect to, possibly 22 or some other port that you that you've said. And then you say these are the login credentials for for the the server at home. And then you go to the second tab and you say, okay, this is my server, and this is when I listen up, listen up, uh, this is when I want you to connect. And so this is when, and you can tell ProxyCap like when I fire up Firefox, connect to home. When I fire up fire up uh, Chrome, just go straight on to the internet. So you can actually point some applications at your home network and some applications directly to whatever connection you're using, or you can say, you know what, ProxyCap, everything. Just shove everything through the tunnel and leave for the internet at home. And that's what I've done on my Mac and on my Windows machine, and I absolutely love it. I don't have it on by default, so you know when I'm home or when I'm on a trusted network, I don't have ProxyCap on. But when I need it, I just right, I just click the icon in the menu bar, and it automatically sets up the connection. And my entire traffic stream is encrypted and encapsulated, and goes through ProxyCap, through the internet to my home router, to my home network, and then goes like a does a U-turn and leaves for the internet at my service provider. So you know when I'm in 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 Dubai, and I enter www pinkfluffyunicorns.com the pink fluffy unicorn server is going to say this guy's from belgium because he's just left the internet for uh, here in belgium and it's really great and the great geeky thing about proxy cap is that you can have a proxy inside a proxy is first connect to home and then connect to somebody else and it's it's crazy but if you want to set something up that's really simple use proxy cap it's free it's available for Windows, it's available on the Mac, it's very easy to operate and will keep your selected traffic or your entire traffic safe. If you want, if you want to go the belt and suspenders, okay, let's do that, okay? So we're going to install ProxyCap on your Windows machine and tell it to connect to your home server via SSH. So that's an SSH tunnel. Then we're going to launch Tor browser and we're going to say, hey Tor, go through the tunnel and then go through another tunnel to whatever access point you want to go onto the internet to and leave there. And then you're going to open up a session in HTTPS. And then that's belt suspenders and, I don't know, a raincoat or duct tape to keep your pants up. That will really anonymize you. The more encryption you use, the more encapsulation you use, the slower your internet connection gets. So if you're doing this over 3G, I mean, might might not be a speedy connection. You don't want to, you know, play World of War, play uh, Halo on that but it does really, really help. I would highly advise you to take a look at a solution like ProxyCap and a home SSH server because then you are in a zone of trust. You don't connect to a third-party VPN server that you don't know, and you only connect through your ISP. But trust goes as far as trust goes. Remember my disclaimer, Tor isn't 100% safe. Uh, you don't know who is doing the exit node. You don't know who is listening. Um, a VP, a third-party VPN client is 100% safe. You never know uh, what they're doing with your traffic. Your home router is um, really 100% safe because you leave the internet via your own ISP. So who do you trust? Well, upstream there is there is it's. A, the further away you get from your laptop, the harder it becomes to really 
you know, stay anonymous and stay secure. The closer by, the easier it gets. So if you want to protect yourself against the NSA, okay, good luck with that. But if you want to just keep safe when you're on a public Wi-Fi network, uh, these solutions work great. So we talked about how to keep your computer safe when you are on, on foreign grounds or on foreign networks. Now we are going to talk about the fact, what do you do if you don't even have a computer and you have to use somebody else's computer or a, pu a public computer or rather lick toilet seats? Um, what do you do then? Well, let's find out. Mm -hmm. Really having a lot of fun. Show's going along really nicely. Uh, export. I have to rush it now because it's AW808. It's been decided. I'm going to get a fast Mac <laughs> that doesn't take off when I'm doing these things. 808 part 4. That's one, one, two, three, four. That's it. Now part 5. <clears throat> If you have to use a computer that is not yours, try not to. You never know what traces you leave behind. The keyboards are ick. You don't know what malware is on the system, and you don't know who is coming after you to snoop. You don't know if there are any key loggers on there. You don't know what you will expose yourself to. You don't know who is watching. But if you have to, try to adhere to some of my tips. When you're doing library computers, hotel computers, try to use a live CD. You can create a Linux live CD very easily on a USB stick and you can boot said computer with the live CD. What actually happens is that it will boot the operating system on the USB stick or the CD, whatever you want, and it doesn't touch the hard drive. There is no, you can sniff around on the hard drive actually, but the hard drive can't get at you. You're not booting the native system that is installed on the computer. It's like it's like a VM, but it's not a VM. The great thing about these live CDs is that you, they're free, they're easy to make, and you can actually um, set them up to be persistent volumes. Persistent volumes mean uh, one thing that changes on the live installation gets saved. So I'll explain. Let's say you burn a live CD of whatever Linux distro you like, Ubuntu, whatever. You boot up the computer with the CD. You do all your things. You can work. You can do everything, but you can't save anything. And at least not to the to the, the the live CD because you can't write back to the CD. With the USB stick, it's kind of the same thing. Whatever you ch whatever you change, whatever changes you make in the OS of the live installation, we'll call it the live CD for for convenience sake, but whatever changes you make in that live operating system, don't get saved. The next time you reboot and you stick your stick in, well, it's just default. You can make a persistent volume on said USB stick that so that the data you save and the settings that you save get saved on the stick, not on the computer, on the stick. And the next time when you boot up, they're there. It's really nice. So using a USB live CD is something that I highly recommend. I would, um, if you're a little bit geeky, um, do this. Go to multisystem.info. I think it's multisystem. Multisystem. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's an app called Multisystem, and it will allow you to make a USB live uh, bootable USB stick that houses not one uh, image of an operating system, but several. So what I've done is I've taken my, my USB stick here. This this is the one. People in the uh, in the show notes and in, in the the YouTube channel will see this. This is my little Dart Fader 16 gigabyte USB drive, and it has four versions of Linux on there. One is a 32-bit version of Lubuntu. One is a 64-bit bit version of Lubuntu. One is a version of Crunchbang, and one is a version of Clonezilla. So there are four versions on that. And when I stick the stick in and I boot up the computer, I can choose which operating system I want to boot up. And the reason I do this is because I boot up a 64-bit live CD or live installation on a 64-bit system and a 32 on a 32. So that way I have four different operating systems with me on my little stick. Works great. I'll put a link to how to do that in the show notes 
We've already talked about this in an article a little while ago. Really, really nice. There's one caveat. If somebody gets hold of my stick, they can actually, if they dig around a little bit, find the data that's on there. You know, it's saved as a file. So one of the better things that you can do is make sure that the stick is encrypted, that people who launch the stick and don't have the password don't get in. Who launch the OS, so for example here, the OS is a selection of files and folders. So if you just put the stick in, you can browse through these files and folders, just, you can, just like you can do with a hard drive. But if you use different versions that encrypt that entire piece of OS into one blob that cannot be accessed, well, that's better. Then that way, if you lose your stick, you won't be able to, people won't be able to look at and see what's on it. And what if you would have a live uh, installation or, uh, you know, a live CD that would also make sure that you were completely private? You know, with all the tour and the this and the that. Well, you know what? Let's it, it's there. It's called Tails. Tails is a Linux distribution that gives you all the goofy ding dongs of Tor and make sure make sure that whatever data is on the stick stays on the stick and cannot be viewed by a third party without a password. Tor, uh, sorry, Tails has been used by Edward Snowden in order for him to communicate uh, privately, you know, using encrypted email and stuff like that. And there was some news about it this week that it had a little bit of a security flaw. Yeah, I know the NSA might want to might want to hack that someday, but you know, for you and your hotel, and if you're a little bit paranoid and there's a hotel computer there, just use Tails. It's great. I mean, it's free, it's simple, it's fast, and you can make it look like XP, which is so hilariously funny. But it's real cloak and dagger stuff, and I love using it. So here on my little stick, I've got uh, a couple of normal Linux distros, but I have another stick, and I won't show you which one, uh, that has my Tails installation on it. And I wanna, when I want to be on a computer and don't leave any trace, and also kind of anonymize and encrypt my traffic, the Tails distro is the way to go. So you will encrypt your traffic, you'll have an encrypted drive, and you will leave no trace whatsoever. Using Tails is a great way to stay safe and is a great live distro to use whenever you need to access the internet and you're not on your home network. <gasps> oh, crap. I didn't save that. Oh, I just... Can I undo... Oh, God, please undo... Tra oh, Oh, I didn't save that. I just closed it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Export. Thank the Matrix for undo. KW808 part 5. That's it. And now for the sign out. And that's all we have time for this week on nightwise.com, KW808 Holiday Anonymity. I hope you found it interesting because uh, it was indeed a very interesting topic to work on and to put the show together. And you can see that sometimes the risks and the dangers of privacy and encryption and security are closer than you think. And sometimes the solutions are simpler than you think. Please don't think this won't happen to me. I won't. I don't have anything that people want. Forget about that. People are not looking specifically for anything you want. They're just looking for your data in general. If they have one password uh, that you use or they have one login, it's so easy to try and log in on all the cloud services in the internet and get hold of whatever you do, even if it's just to do some mischief. And there are a lot of digital voyeurs out there who love nothing more than to sniff open wireless network and go home and get kicks out of analyzing what has been going through and reading other people's email, whether they're interesting or not. The chance that private information will fall into the wrong hands uh, is an existing chance. The information will be sometimes useless, sometimes just embarrassing, or sometimes it might actually hurt yourself. There are people out there who want to nose around in your naked pictures, but there are also people out there who want to get hold of your PayPal account and steal your identity. And somewhere in a bunker, somewhere off the coast, uh, on the coast of England, there are people who are collecting your data, and there's not a lot you can do about that, except 
put them, you know, give them a hard time by using as much encryption and uh, stuff like that as possible. Again, it's not that li that you have anything to hide, but your privacy is your right. And when you're using foreign computers or foreign networks that are not your own, being safe is being wise. And you are, are you not a wise girl or a wise guy? So that's about it. KW808 is done. Uh, please, uh, if you haven't done so, start following us on Twitter and on Facebook because we are doing some interesting campaigns. We're posting links every day to very interesting hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform geeks. You can find us on nightwise.com slash Twitter and nightwise and, uh, of course, nightwise.com slash Facebook. There's, of course, the Google Plus group, nightwise.com slash Google Plus, uh, where you can interact with other cross-platform sliders and talk tech. Unfortunately, all the interesting links that we have don't get to Google Plus because Google Plus doesn't allow us to multi-post different social channels. So uh, subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook uh, just to get the links. And if you want to get some interesting uh, encounters with like-minded sliders, go to the nightwise.com uh, Google Plus group. Uh, we have some interesting um, campaigns last week. We have the question of the week, the challenge of the week. You can check out the tweets and check out the answers of all the different wise guys around the world. It's a lot of fun. If you want to get back to us another way, not via Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or classic smoke signals, you can send us an email. Feedback at nightwise.com is that address. And that's about all we have this week. So... If you want to support the show, you don't have to give us a donation. You can if you want to, but you're not obliged to. You don't want you don't have to. The only thing you have to do is share us with somebody else. If you have a friend that's a geek, share our uh, website with them. Share our podcast with them. Tell them about the nightwise.com podcast where hacks, tips and tweaks for cross-platform geeks are abundant. So uh, that's all we ask. If we have a, we, we like a plus on Google Plus, we like a, a like on Facebook, we like a share or we retweet even more. The more, the merrier here on Nightwise.com. That's about all we have time for. We will see you next week, hopefully safely, securely, encrypted, anonymized, encapsulated, and uh, completely opaque to whatever nosy snut boy, 16-year-old uh, strip kitty is in the corner of Starbucks desperately trying to find out URLs to new adult, site because, new adult sites because he was running out of them themselves. Don't be a victim. Take control of your own privacy, anonymity, and the right to have ownership of your own data and your data in transit. My name is Nightwise. I will see you again next week. Also live on the Google Plus Hangout. You can uh, watch the uh, entire Hangout on the nightwise.com website, by the way. And until then, let technology work for you instead of the other way around. And uh, stay safe. Bye, guys and girls. Bye-bye. There. That's it. Show recorded. I had a great time. It was nice. I, you know, got into my groove and did the funny voices. I wanted to sound like, you know, the guy from, from Toy Story, the dinosaur. Oh, Barney. Barney the dinosaur. It must be because I was watching Cheers lately. That's it, guys and girls. See you guys on the flip side. Until then, let technology work for you. Stay the other way around. Subscribe to the show. That's really important. Especially you. Yeah, you, 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 YouTubers. YouTubers, you must subscribe to the show. I know, I know you like to watch me and watch my starships and watch me blooper and goof off. But you, you have to subscribe. Subscribing is important. Subscribing is powerful. Yes, it is. And it helps you uh, to skip these parts where my caffeine is definitely going uh, somewhere where I'm becoming hyperactive and I need to close down the show. That's it for me. See you guys on the flip side. Bye-bye.